Hi, I'm Ran Levy. Welcome to Malicious Life in collaboration with Cyber Reason. Quick content warning before we get started. This episode contains discussion of a grisly murder. How do you catch a hacker who's covered their tracks? Security experts have all kinds of ways of tracking cyber criminals. Sometimes it doesn't take much. If a hacker isn't careful, like Gary McKinnon, whose story we told in an earlier episode of Malicious Life, they may leave behind personal data like an IP address or a girlfriend's email address. Jon Johansson, the teenager behind DCSS, openly bragged about his role in creating an illegal software. All anybody had to do to get to him was, well, write an email. Advanced actors, such as nation-states, are tougher to pin down. When GitHub was attacked, it was the insight of one independent security professional to use Traceroute, an ancient and somewhat obscure system command that tracks internet packets. When Sony, Google and the Democratic National Committee were hacked, circumstantial evidence, such as the nature of the attack and the victims and systems that were targeted, played heavily into attributing those responsible. Let's suppose we've got a case where no such clues are available. We're dealing with a really good hacker. They've listened to every Malicious Life episode, and so they know all the pitfalls to avoid. They design new malware from scratch, route their attacks through various proxy servers, and so on. How do we begin to approach catching such a hacker? At this year's Black Hat, I spoke with one cybersecurity expert who's got a theory. Hi, uh, so my name is Matt Wixey. Um, I lead cybersecurity research for PwC's uh, cybersecurity practice in the UK. My role is to look at uh, emerging attack vectors and kind of un- un- unconventional approaches to security for both attack and defense uh, and to kind of explore emerging technologies as well. I have kind of quite a um, an odd background um, getting into cyber security so my first degree was in English language and literature so yeah a bit of an odd path to cyber security and I kind of really got interested in linguistics there um, I started off being really interested in etymology which is kind of the origin of words but then into linguistics and then I worked in law enforcement for a few years as well Matt's experience in linguistics and law enforcement combine to inform a concept he calls human side channels and It describes a category of information that cybersecurity investigators often use in order to track and attribute the sources of a well-executed hack, where simpler means of doing so are not available. It's a term that I've coined um, to describe unintentional leakage as a result of human behavior. Um, so the term kind of comes from computer side channels, which are... Um, unintentional leakage in kind of primitive computer outputs so things like sound and light and electromagnetic radiation um, so kind of very interesting and very active field in security and human side channels are a development of that looking at humans as, as kind of like a, a sort of biocomputer I guess so that the fact that kind of when humans um, produce some kind of output whether that's writing or speech or, or typing or something like that that there will be kind of a uh, unintentional leakage which could be used to um, to attribute activities to a certain individual there are three groups of human side channels forensic linguistics behavioral signatures and cultural captures let's start with forensic linguistics and how cyber investigators can use this practice to catch hackers much as law enforcement investigators do to catch criminals and On December 2nd, 1949, police unlocked the door to a tiny wooden outhouse behind a run-down tenement building in West London. 
in it, they found the cold bodies of a woman and her one-year-old daughter. Back in police custody, the case's prime suspect was asked if he committed the murders. He said yes. What would seem like the end of this story was ultimately far from it. Timothy Evans, the man who admitted to murdering his wife and one-year-old daughter, is remembered 70 years later because his case was not straightforward at all. Its evidence was contradictory, its timeline confusing, and its characters idiosyncratic. Timothy Evans was not a simple man. His father had abandoned the family before his birth. Due to a chronic skin condition, he missed years of schooling and by adulthood was largely illiterate. He was an alcoholic to boot, bad with money and highly temperamental. According to some accounts, he also had a tendency to make up stories about himself. The spouse would already be suspect number one in an investigation of this kind, but Evans was a uniquely good suspect. His stories changed, not a little, but a lot, as new evidence was presented to him. And he wasn't particularly shy about confessing to the gruesome acts he was charged with. Despite the gravity of the crimes, a bevy of conflicting evidence and another major suspect, John Christie, his downstairs neighbor, Evans's trial took just three days and the jury took just 40 minutes in their deliberation. Really, it's easy to understand why. How long would it take you to find a man guilty who at one point openly admitted to it? Timothy Evans, just 25 years old, was hanged in March 1950. Of course, he didn't actually do it. But that only came to light three years later when a neighbor found three bodies stuffed in the kitchen pantry of his downstairs neighbor. The Evans case was seminal in UK legal history, in part because of the criticisms leveled at the police overseeing the investigation. Many pointed out issues in how they handled key evidence and how they drew out the confession. A linguist um, called Jan Svartvik uh, later looked at the statements that Timothy Evans had given to the police. And he, um, by analysing those linguistic features in the statements, he found that there were two different writing styles in those statements. Uh, one of them he could attribute to Timothy Evans, um, who was being interviewed. But there was another one uh, which was particularly present in passages uh, which were incriminating. And um, what Svartovic found was that basically the police officers who'd interviewed Evans, rather than... Um, just kind of writing down word for word what he'd said they'd actually influenced what he'd said um, to to make him seem guilty of the crime the transcripts of evans's confession were supposed to be word for word later analysis demonstrated evidence that they were in fact not evans as we mentioned was uneducated hardly literate some particularly important passages in his statements to police sounded out of character, the kind of language more likely to come from a police officer than an illiterate man. The Timothy Evans case demonstrated to the world how useful forensic linguistics can be in law enforcement. Had it been around in the early 50s, Evans likely wouldn't have been sentenced to death. Instead, he and the other women Christie murdered after Christie was found wrongly innocent became martyrs upon which a new field was born. So the, the linguist uh, Svartvik, he, he then uh, wrote a paper on this and coined the term forensic linguistics. And that was in kind of 1968, I think that, coined, that, that term was coined. Um, 
and since then it's kind of been used uh, to some degree in kind of law enforcement investigations in the real world it's also used for um, like plagiarism investigations in academia it was used to try and work out if Shakespeare had actually written Shakespeare's plays um, same with the Federalist Papers and more recently with um, with J.K. Rowling with the first book after Harry Potter um, where it was kind of written under a pseudonym forensic linguistics was used to show that it actually was Rowling who wrote it Forensic linguistics rests on one inescapable aspect of human nature, that we're all different, unique, and therefore distinguishable from one another in our speech. So the, the kind of theory that because we all have a unique uh, upbringing and experiences and education, that we um, have a unique way of looking at the world and a unique way of... Um, Expressing uh, ourselves. Expressing ourselves, guessing. exactly, yeah, and, and kind of the way we kind of form output. So um, forensic linguistics is kind of an example of that, um, particularly something called stylometry, which is um, writing style. So um, it's looking at very kind of granular features of someone's writing, picking those out, uh, and that would be things like average word length, average sentence length, um, the construction of sentences, particular kind of turns of phrase and words, which taken together can be used to uh, potentially identify your writing style amongst a set of writing styles. So if I had kind of 10 pieces of writing that I know you'd done, for instance, and then I had a piece of text and I wanted to find out whether or not you'd written it, um, I could kind of pick out the features from those 10 pieces um, and compare them against that unknown text to see what the kind of probability is that you had written it. An illiterate man experiencing the murders of his wife and daughter will likely express himself differently than a police officer attempting to impersonate that man. Unintentional leakage occurred when the officers working Evans's case tried putting words in his mouth but ended up giving themselves away. So forensic linguistics can, in some cases, attribute testimony to a speaker by identifying unintentional leakage. The question now is whether we can find unintentional leakages in code to identify the author of a malware. According to Matt, we can, because forensic analysis is not specific to any one form of writing. It applies to any expression of language, if adjusted properly, for context. And that's even without regards to the content of the, of the actual written piece. It could be just any kind of written material that I wrote, just based on the style. Absolutely, yeah. So it, it's pretty much not to do with content at all. Um, it's just about the very kind of granular uh, linguistic aspects of it. Forensic linguistics experts track spelling, grammar, vocabulary, sentence structure, and word choice. When cybersecurity experts try to catch a hacker who's covered their tracks well, they use these same techniques. For example, a peculiarity in source code that also showed up in another malware program might be useful in tying two distinct malicious programs to the same perpetrator. Um, some of the use cases for defense would include things like detecting sock puppet accounts. So social media accounts that are um, under different usernames but run by the same person, for instance. And obviously that's something that's very kind of relevant socially at the moment in terms of politics and, and kind of uh, manipulating consensus and that sort of thing. Um, another would be um, threat intelligence and incident response. So if you have a threat actor who is sending out spear phishing emails and maybe they're running different campaigns aimed at different organizations, maybe even with different pretexts for the, the social engineering. Um, if you kind of collect those spear phishing emails together, you can still look for common features and potentially attribute them to the same, uh, same individual who wrote them. Forensic analysis is also useful in sussing out hackers trying to mask their identities through deception. When the DNC was hacked in 2016, somebody calling themselves Guccifer 2.0 claimed responsibility. In an interview with Vice magazine, this individual claimed to be Romanian, and, you know, definitely not Russian. By 2018, forensic evidence tied the persona to an officer in Russia's military intelligence directorate and confirmed what everybody expected in the first place, that Guccifer 2.0 was a decoy, a story meant to confuse news reporting 
deflect blame and troll investigators. The next type of human side channel, behavioral signatures, is something cybersecurity investigators have been weaponizing for a long time now. It's particularly useful against the biggest and most powerful hacking groups in the world, like APT1. With all the hundreds of APTs out there, you've got to be pretty badass to earn the title of APT1. Even the Russian groups that hacked the DNC in 2016 only get to be APT28 and 29. APT1 lived up to its title, though. For over a decade, beginning in 2002, they successfully siphoned valuable proprietary information from over 1,000 American companies, including the United States Steel Corporation, Westinghouse Electric, and Lockheed Martin. As corporation after corporation fell victim to similar breaches, some behavioral patterns started to emerge as investigators drew closer and closer to an identifiable perpetrator. So it's based on a technique called case linkage analysis, which again is a, a real-world investigation technique that um, can be kind of repurposed. Um, so case linkage analysis is essentially kind of behavioral profiling. It's separate from offender profiling. So offender profiling kind of looks at the features of a crime and tries to infer something about the person who committed it. Behavioral profiling or case linkage analysis takes uh, very granular aspects of a crime scene, of, of what was done during a crime, and compares it to another crime to see how similar they are. And then to, as a result, try and work out how likely it is that the same offender committed both of those crimes. Just as each of us has a certain way of expressing ourselves with language that can give us away in, in an investigation, each of us has certain ways that we behave in both day-to-day -day life and in cyberspace. No two crimes are the same because no two criminals are the same. So uh, in burglary, for instance, in a burglary case, you might look at uh, did the offender use a crowbar to get into the door and if so was it at the top of the door or the bottom of the door like a burglar who always breaks into homes with a crowbar through the bottom of the front door apt1 had its own unique calling card as the security firm mandate uncovered in a report it published about the campaign apt1 had their own custom method for communicating with the malware it planted inside the network as Mandiant's report explains, firewalls can be effective at keeping malware outside the network from communicating with systems inside the network, but less so when it comes to malware already inside the network trying to communicate with a command and control server outside of it. Using a spear phishing email, APT1 would install a relatively simple and thin featured backdoor inside the victim network called a beachhead. The beachhead backdoor would then retrieve an HTML web page from the command and control server. These web pages would contain special HTML tags that the backdoor malware would then attempt to interpret as actual commands. So an HTML comment field, for example, could be used instead as a scripting command. For their particular use of this kind of backdoor, APT1 earned a nickname, Comment Crew. Investigators were able to use this particular leakage as evidence linking one corporate attack to another and another and another. By 2014, it had become clear that over 1,000 hacks of U.S. companies were not disparate independent events, but in fact a coordinated effort by the People's Liberation Army of China. While attack methods are the most common sources of information in cyber investigations, there are other behavioral side channels that are even more interesting. Even the most minute features of the way a hacker types can give them away if they're not careful. 
an investigator operating a honeypot can track, for example, the speed with which somebody types or the little choices they make when navigating around the system. What I did uh, was I got 10 volunteers who were kind of pen testers and students and that kind of thing. And I got each of them to attack uh, two virtual machines that I set up. Um, and these virtual machines were configured with deliberate privilege escalation vulnerabilities and kind of had like interesting fake data and that sort of thing. And I asked these 10 volunteers to attack each VM to try and escalate their privileges, to poke around the file system, to exfiltrate the data and that kind of thing. And while they were doing that, uh, I was logging their keystrokes over SSH. Once uh, the attacks had finished, I took all those keystrokes and uh, separated them into commands. So looking at the command switches that they were using and the tools they were using and used that to kind of um, to try and see if I could link together where uh, one of those volunteers had attacked both machines, if you see what I mean. To analyze behavioral signatures, you first identify a class of activity to focus on. For example, what kinds of terminal commands an individual uses when navigating around the computer system? It seems like such a small thing to focus on, but two different people, even when they're trying to achieve the same goal, are likely going to take different paths to get there. If you gather enough of these little data points, you have a data set to work with. Next, you apply what's called a similarity coefficient and use statistical tools to yield the probability that any two attacks were carried out by the same volunteer. The math involved in reaching these probabilities is complicated, but the idea is not. The more commonalities between two different attacks, the more likely it is that the same malicious actor carried them out. Yeah, we had uh, pretty good results for that. So um, depending on the kind of behavior type we were looking at, we got between uh, 91% and 99% accuracy. If you've ever filled out an online form, you've probably experienced a CAPTCHA. They're those little boxes with obscured letters that you have to read and then type out. They're used in order to prove that you're a human and not a bot. Cultural captures are perhaps the strangest human side channel of the three we're discussing in this episode. They refer to the little cultural signifiers that each of us knows implicitly, but only because of where and when we grew up. Like ordinary captures, they might be a useful means of snuffing out an online disguise. Let's take a hypothetical. Say I, Ran Levy, am trying to pass as an American instead of an Israeli, which is the real case. How would you be able to tell that I'm lying? Well, for one thing, my accent will probably give me away. But who knows, maybe I just have a peculiar speech impediment. One thing you could do is to take me to a KFC restaurant and ask me to order a meal for the two of us. Since I'm used to using the metric system and not the imperial units of measurements used in the US, I'll probably order enough wings and mashed potatoes to feed an average family. This might indicate that I'm not, in fact, an American. And if you're wondering, yes, this actually happened to me on my first visit to the States. And don't get me started on your ridiculously sized coffee cups. In the cyber world, you can try the same kind of thing. For example, much has been made of social media accounts created by Russian intelligence agents to influence Western politics. Obviously, the reason why these accounts work is because they mask their true origins effectively. They use profile pictures stolen from elsewhere on the web. And rather than jumping in with inflammatory content from day one, they might begin by posting ordinary material over a long period of time. An account with a long history will seem more legitimate. So how do you catch a Russian impersonating a Westerner if they've covered all their tracks? 
But say you have an account from the UK, for instance, that's posting very strong views about Brexit would be a good example. Um, and maybe trying to kind of manipulate consensus around Brexit or to, to influence conversations. How do we know that that account is actually from the UK? Um, so there are things you can look at in terms of metadata and that kind of thing, but obviously those can be spoofed. Um, so uh, cultural captures, as I call them, is, is potentially a way to, to try and at least give an indication um, as to whether an account is actually from the country it claims to be. Um, and it's using something called cultural references that for whatever reason haven't really spread beyond their country of origin. So there was actually a, a really interesting example in the film uh, Inglorious Bastards, the, the Quentin Tarantino film. Um, there's a scene where uh, I think it's I think it's Michael Fassbender is kind of undercover as a Nazi officer in France, and he's trying not to give himself away. Um, and he signals to the bartender for three glasses, and he holds his his first three fingers up, um, and that actually gives him away because in Germany, when people signal three, they put their first two fingers and their thumb up. Um, <laughs> So that's kind of, uh, you know, obviously that wouldn't work now as a cultural capture because everyone knows about it. But but that's kind of an example of, you know, little kind of cultural differences that if you're not from a particular country, you haven't spent a lot of time in that country, you wouldn't necessarily know. Cultural captures are very niche and don't really factor into common cybersecurity practice today. It doesn't mean they aren't useful, just that we're only just starting to develop these kinds of methods. Exactly. It needs more research. Yeah, it's kind of an initial idea. Um, and again, you know, as with linguistics and as with the um, the behavioral stuff, it's something I'm going to kind of um, try and get people to, to get involved with and see whether or not it could work. How do we catch a hacker who's covered all their tracks? A hacker who's created their malware from scratch, spoofed their identity and routed their connection through a maze of servers that you simply can't track them through. By analyzing human side channels, we may just have a few newer ways of identifying even the cleverest of malicious actors. If we can capture their malicious program, we can use forensic analysis to piece together clues as to what kind of person or persons may have written it. If we can cross-examine multiple attacks and find similarities between them, it might reveal details about how our attackers tend to operate. Maybe they left little clues without even realizing it, identifying them as being of a particular nationality. These analysis methods all rely on the same underlying truth, that hackers are people and people are unique and imperfect. There is no such thing really as covering all your tracks. Even the best hackers leave some clues behind. It's the job of cybersecurity experts to develop the tools and methods necessary to sniffing out those clues, however well hidden they are. That's it for this episode. A big thanks to Matt Wixey from PwC for taking the time to talk to me last August on Black Hat 2019. In the previous episode, we discussed cyber insurance and, in particular, why it hadn't taken off yet. On Twitter, we asked you, the listeners, for your opinions on cyber insurance. As expected, there were some very conflicting views on the matter. G. Granez wrote, quote, I think cyber insurance is good because it allows people who use a service that has been compromised to be compensated in some way, especially if the company faces a new malware or type of breach. Regardless, a company should secure their systems and data properly and vigilantly, end quote. Twitter user question, spelled in leadspeak Q3ST10N, had a different view. Quote, I believe cyber insurance promotes bad security. Companies already only bear a small cut in their bottom line, and this product drops that to nearly zero. Why hire people to protect your data when you can get insurance and fire the CISO? End quote. 
Dave Jayar Rises from Connecticut echoed this view, and he wrote, quote, Maybe companies should do better at securing their networks and training staff to become vigilant against potential attacks, end quote. Jesse Fogarty from Toronto raised a very interesting question that spawned a very interesting debate. Jesse wrote, quote, Great episode. Question. Do you think that the increase in small and medium-sized businesses purchasing insurance will attract hackers? I feel like opportunistic hackers, they're going after municipal government and larger businesses because they can presume they have insurance. End quote. This is actually an important question that never occurred to me when I interviewed Jeffrey Smith for the episode. But luckily, Jeffrey was available on Twitter to give us his view on the matter. Quote, Hard to argue that knowledge of enforced cyber insurance will not increase random demands. It's unfortunate some risks, municipalities, for example, feel obligated to announce to all they buy coverage. Make all efforts to guard who knows about cyber insurance purchases. End quote. And indeed, Jeff from Texas wrote, quote, We have cyber insurance at my company, and we specifically are instructed not to mention it. End quote. We ask you this same question in the form of a Twitter poll. 45% of the voters think that, yes, the widespread adoption of cyber insurance will increase the number of cyber attacks on small and medium-sized businesses. 30% thought it won't increase the number of cyber attacks, and 25% said they might start hacking SMBs themselves. Thanks to all those who voted and tweeted me their answers. This week's question, as usual in the spirit of this episode, is if you were to hack some network, what are your personal quirks and peculiarities that would give you away if someone was monitoring that network? For me, I guess it would be the number of gibberish commands I'd enter, as I always forget if my keyboard is set to Hebrew or English. So what is your human side channel? Write to me via Twitter at at Ranlevy, that's R-A-N-L-E-V-I, or at Malicious Life. As always, if you have stories you want to share with me or suggestions for cool new topics for future episodes of Malicious Life, I'm always happy to hear from you. Write to me via Twitter or email me at ran at ranlevy.com. Our website is malicious.life, where you'll find all of our past episodes and full transcripts. Malicious Life is produced by PI Media. I haven't mentioned my production company so far in the episodes, but Malicious Life is just one of many podcasts we create for various companies and organizations. So if you or someone you know work for an organization that needs a podcast, tell them about Malicious Life and PI Media. My personal expertise, and the company's in general, is turning complex and complicated knowledge into engaging stories that will captivate your audience. Write to me at ran at ranlevy.com. That's R-A-N-L-E-V-I dot com. That's it for today. Thanks again to Cyber Reason for underwriting the podcast. Learn more at cyberreason.com. Bye-bye. Oh my god. CK music, music, music.